All right, welcome to our session on a day in the life of the GitOps platform team. Um, May Large, you uh, introduced myself earlier at the, the <laughs> panel. I, I own and drive the GitOps topic at State Farm, and I'm joined by... I'm Priyanka Ravi, I also go by Pinky. I'm a software developer on May's team, the GitOps platform team. Um, yeah. All right. All right, so every organizational change especially the ones brought forward by automation, it's really, it, it all starts with an idea. And really that idea is an, an attempt or an effort to make things better or solve a problem. And GitOps is one of the many results when we as an organization decided to focus on developer experience. How do we enable our developers, our 7,000 developers, to realize innovation into the hands of our customers. Our customers being either our agents or our digital customers accessing statefarm.com. So when we first heard about GitOps, and this was back in Dallas, we have a hub presence there. Um, we got introduced to the concept of GitOps as we were figuring out how to efficiently deploy to our on-prem Kubernetes cluster. As soon as we understood the gravity and the benefits that we're gonna get out of GitOps, we knew we needed to go to work. And by we, I'm talking a three-person GitOps platform team that, that started this all. Myself, uh, Russ, Russ, who's our engineer, who's probably watching, and, and Pinky here. We were OG of the GitOps platform team. So way before GitOps was generally available at State Farm, we spent cycles in making sure that everybody gets excited about GitOps. Yes, we would still talk about the current deployment release process that we have, but we really would spend a, a significant amount to get everyone excited about GitOps. And this is to complete that GitOps pitch, to get this organizational change to happen. So out of the pitch, we're really different reactions. One, from our compliance folks, it's about, hey, prove to me that in the case of an audit, we are able to pass or fulfill requirements one through five. The second reaction is really from our first line leaders, the ones signing off on changes affecting their product. And so it's a mix of, hey, I'm not very familiar with Git workflows, which was brought up earlier in a panel discussion. And on the other hand, managers who are really excited about the transparency. Like, oh, I can actually see the files change. The actual lines of code changed to realize this feature that empowers them and enables them to better review the evidence of testing that go along with it, giving them the better confidence that this is good to go to production. Last and certainly not the least, I'm talking about the 7,000 developers who were really excited about GitOps because they're the ones who we're catering to. And I remember this one feedback from an engineer in, in Atlanta, and he said, if y'all can realize this, if you can make GitOps a thing at State Farm, y'all will be our heroes. And so we knew we needed to go to work. And this is, I'm gonna turn it to Pinky to talk about what we <coughs> enabled. Yeah, so obviously in order to make GitOps a thing at State Farm, there was a lot of enablement that we had to do starting with how do we even set up the config repos? How do we make sure that they meet the compliance standards that are set forth to us? Um, we actually landed on using the um, Terraform GitLab provider, and that way we could actually uh, take advantage of like infrastructure as code benefits, you know, reusability, um, manageability, and lots of other things, right? So that's one of the big um, foundational things that we had to set up. Another thing that we had to set up is our onboarding app. So it's actually a UI that our consumers can um, interface with and get quickly set up using the GitOps process in State Farm. Um, another thing that we have are uh, a handful of scripts and some run on one-off situations. And then we have a handful of other ones that actually run on a scheduled um, pipeline. One of those is one that we call affectionately the enforcer. And basically that one runs nightly. Um, it, uses, it utilizes Terraform Enterprise, and so that runs nightly to make sure that they're all still meeting those compliance standards that are set forth. Um, another one that we have is we actually utilize Vault as our secret storage, and then we have our cookbook, which is basically our documentation. It's a place for our consumers to go get um, announcements, to have answers to frequently asked questions, to like see our um, some of our other 
um, enabled um, API and CLI. And then also uh, the way that our consumers interface with us directly is through our Rocket Chat channel, and that's where they come and ask us questions, and um, and other people can kind of see the, the questions that they ask as well and get theirs answered as well. And then one thing that May's going to touch on in a in a bit is our monitoring and dashboards, and that's a nice place for us to kind of see where um, the trends are in our data. And uh, okay, so you can see here that we have a, a diagram on this board. We do have GitOps enabled for all three platforms listed here, AWS, um, our on-prem Kubernetes, and Cloud Foundry. And this diagram is basically a very vanilla workflow. Um, it show, Okay, so when a general process, a developer pushes code to their um, source code repo, and once it goes into master, it'll kick off a GitLab CI pipeline that uses our um, internally developed GitOps CLI. And that will actually create a merge request into their config repo with just the config files that are necessary to do the deployment. And from there, there's the um, deployment mechanism, which is either, in some cases, for AWS, it's Terraform Enterprise for us. Um, it could be a pipeline. It could be Flux for Kubernetes. And so that will do the deployment. And then the other thing that happens is another thing that we created internally. It's our GitOps API. And that actually kicks off uh, using a webhook from GitLab that creates a, um, a change record in our asset management uh, repo. And then, so AWS was actually the first one that we enabled at State Farm. And the way that we did that was we basically consumed our own dog food and utilizes an app, utilized an app that we have internally deployed. And that way our consumers could see an exemplar. Our next one that we enabled was our on-prem Kubernetes. And that one, we, like I said a second ago, we utilize Flux as the deployment mechanism. And I will touch on the, a little bit more on the Kubernetes in a little bit. But basically, our last one, and the most recently enabled one, thanks to Nimi over there, is Cloud Foundry. And so that one, that one is, um, we actually ended up utilizing pipeline templates to make that process more friendly for our consumers. And then we also, um, so that actually utilizes the Cloud Foundry CLI. We had to adjust some of the config repo modules, and then we also use um, short-lived access just to full de fulfill deployments through UAA. Okay, so uh, continuing with kind of like the, the Cloud Foundry side, um, obviously as the GitOps platform team, a huge part of what we do is migration all the time. So one thing that we're still working on is um, migrating from Jenkins to GitLab CI. And that is actually still a work in progress. Our Cloud Foundry users are mostly on Jenkins. And um, we actually have this dashboard that shows us where like, that status is, and we can monitor what the progress is on that migration. Um, another thing that we set up, so our, as I think May mentioned in the last session as well, our on-prem Kubernetes was already developed. So we wanted to update it and allow for when new people, when new namespaces are created, we wanted it to have a Flux instance. That way, it can be listening to their config repo. And so we actually ended up enabling Flux multi-tenancy uh, last year um, on our on-prem Kubernetes solution. And then right now, we are actually working on updating that from even Flux one to Flux two. So that's the process we're doing right now. All right, another huge part of being in the GitOps platform team is education. Earlier we said training, 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 right? It's, it's the best way to realize a, a large organizational change like adopting GitOps. So over time, we have gotten, it's now become an expectation that as soon as we enable GitOps into one of our strategic platforms, it's a given that we're gonna do a roadshow. Uh, we focus obviously on the, the core, the foundational pieces as Pinky walked us through, but then focus on how do you really apply your changes to this particular platform versus this particular platform? And as Pinky mentioned, we recently enabled it for Cloud Foundry, and we just did a, a roadshow for that. All right. Um, beyond the roadshows, I, I touched on this earlier, we realized we're obviously part of a larger community. So we've really been intentional in sharing our progress beyond outside a state farm and it's through that that we really got to connect with wonderful people a lot of them are here to help get that help that dialogue to start going and exchange ideas on how to solve those problems so since 2019 um, russ and i presented GitOps for the win um, 
That was fun. <laughs> Last year was Pinky and I when we talked about GitOps and Terraform, a match made in heaven. And earlier this year, the, the recording still out there when Russ and I uh, went into detail as far as how did we do Flux multi-tenancy. All right, so <clears throat> uh, basically I'm going to walk through like what our day-to-day -day looks like with support and all that. But before I do, I want to mention that we're actually a five-person team right now. So we went up, we upgraded from the three-person team we started with. And it's nice because there's May, obviously she's our manager, <laughs> and she does a lot of technical stuff too. And then um, there's Nimi, who's more, um, like she knows more about Cloud Foundry. She's our expert on that. And then there's Russ, our engineer, who is our AWS expert. Then I focus more on Kubernetes. And then we actually, our new member, Adam, he does a lot of our data-driven stuff. So that's really cool. It's like nice to have that balance. Okay, so our day-to-day, -day, we actually, <laughs> we were getting really swamped. It was really hard for us to manage, like keeping up with new tasks, and then also like trying to answer support questions all the time. So we actually came up with a system that we've been recently doing where we have a weekly support rotation. So one of us will be like on call and we'll be the ones that'll be monitoring that GitOps channel, uh, the, yeah, the GitOps channel in Rocket Chat that I mentioned earlier. And that's actually been working out really well because we don't have to constantly context switch as much as we used to. Um, another thing that we do daily is we check on that enforcer run that I mentioned a second ago at minimum just to make sure that the secrets were rotated and then also just to make sure nothing funky happened. <laughs> and then, um, uh, so, our, uh, we're, we're big about community within State Farm and also outside of State Farm. Um, within State Farm, we uh, have frequent touch points with our platform admins just to make sure that we're all on the same page and kind of talk about if they've heard any new tech and we've heard any, so we're all just like, you know, kind of hashing it out, it's kind of fun. And then um, <clears throat> outside of State Farm, we um, are pretty active in like GitHub discussions about Flux, um, Terraform, GitLab, there's a bunch of other things. and then. Um, we were really blessed to have Weaveworks uh, ha do a, um, a little uh, workshop, the Flux2 migration workshop with us. And that was really cool because we were able to ask them questions, kind of give them feedback on their documentation. And so it was kind of like a nice little partnership. And then um, one thing that we do every week is we have an hour-long office hours session. And we have like a sign-up sheet and people can sign up. And that's kind of a nice place for them to come get more hands-on, like one-on-one -on -one help if they need it. Next is the fun part, outages, <laughs> right? There's no support that's complete without having to deal with outages. And so as Pinky and I were preparing for this, we kind of reflected on what were at least the top two, top two things that we had to rally around, drop everything we're doing, right? Recover our customers. Yeah. So the top um, has to do with secrets. We all have secrets in every automation that we provide. Um, these secrets have elevated permissions, whether it's in your Git, Git repository or in your target cluster or in your target environment. Uh, thankfully, those exposures that happen were internally initiated by our penetration test team. But the key takeaway is over time, we've gotten better at limiting the number of secrets that get passed around into the, the components or the solution stack behind GitOps. The less that we require or expect our customers to provide secret A, secret B, just so it can do such and such, deploy keys and et cetera, the better. We still follow the convention. We know where to grab the secrets from our vaulting solution, but we don't let them have to pass it to us and promote or have likelihood, higher likelihood of a compromise. The second, and this is funny because it happened while I was on vacation and I came back and like, oh, Type of deal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, blocks get deployed. Those secrets are all still there. But if you look into any one of them, the flux get deployed, the actual data, the actual secret is gone. And so, again, following your standard operating procedure, dropped everything we're doing, and we fixed it by rolling out just a simple bash script that looped through all the namespaces that were impacted, exact into the flux, the running flux pod grab the identity that we needed and patch that secret again to recover our customer. But that's just step one, right? The real benefit is how do we, how do we mature? How do we learn from this? And so we started with, we know the time frame on when the situation occurred, right? So it's a lot of combing through logs. So I say, I say it's a lot of splunking. And then out of that, right, that, 
In addition to obviously understanding the logs, it's also working with our um, Kubernetes operators. And so it, oil, it all boiled down to the fact that there is a worker node that had gone bad. It was kubelet that would report itself as, hey, I'm still part of this cluster, but other times I'm, I'm not. And so, okay, that's a contributing factor, but what rendered kubelet in that bad state? And really it came down to, again, lots of working sessions, but it's the CNI stuff that was getting flaky. So it's unable, that this particular worker node was unable to report itself. And so it got into a taint manager execution error that just dropped the, the flux pods. And so the takeaway though is yes, now we understand why did this happen, right? And so we do have Prometheus alerts that fired up. At the time, we, the GitOps platform team, were not included in that. So that was one change. Another key enhancement that we did, well, this is kind of a maturity aspect for us, is to actually drain a lot of those logs, all those rich events that are emanating from Flux system. Because that's where a lot of the Flux resources are at. And getting alerted when things aren't behaving the way we expect them to. Okay. Operation. So GitOps has been around or generally available at State Farm since January of 2020. And over time, we've gotten better at the metrics and observability. So it's an expectation, it's a given, that a lot of the pieces that make up the GitOps solution stack come with Prometheus and Grafana, the alerts, and we take action. And that's for the onboarding app and the UI that Pinky walked us through. We also have pieces running in AWS, and we just leverage the out-of-the-box AWS services for monitoring those, um, those pieces. And you chat with us, we're here, <laughs> we're here all week. Uh, we're happy to chit chat about the specifics, the details, or hit us up on LinkedIn or Slack. So that's one side, right? It's about ensuring the availability of the components that make up the GitOps solution stack. But also, one other thing that we set, for, we set forth for this year is how do we bring forward the value that our customers get from using GitOps? And that's really what's getting into a couple of dashboards that we took a screenshot of. One is three, three metrics that I'm really excited about. One is deployment events. How many people are actually using GitOps and by which platform? AWS being the top consumer of GitOps at State Farm. Next is change lead time. And welcome to di further dialogue on this. But how we're measuring change lead time right now is how from the moment a code change is pushed remotely in a source repo, we captured that time frame from that point until that same commit SHA is applied and merged in your target config repo, which means it's realized into your target environment, your production environment. Another side effect or a, a, another metric that got added as a result of change lead time is change size, which um, it's super exciting to us. Because GitOps is about small miniature changes going straight to production. So because of that homegrown solution that I talked about earlier, where we're capturing a lot of those milestones as a code change progresses all the way to prod, we're able to harvest all that data and understand how many files were changed, how many lines of code were changed. And that's leading into the change size metric that we are now reporting to our customers. Next is Hardening. I already touched on this earlier, right? About lessening the number of secrets that we pass around. But it also goes without saying that we, we embrace policy as code. For our Terraform related resources, we use Sentinel. And for our Kubernetes cluster, we started using Kyberno to enforce tenant isolation. Last and certainly not the least is governance. And a lot of this is leading up to governance. Um, we were good at gathering the data making meaning out of the rich deployment, GitOps deployments. And now, this is a recent enhancement that we just added. We are able to, in real time, alert the necessary stakeholders when there is a merge request that gets applied in a config repo without any prior approval, without any first line leader approval. Because at the end of the day, we still have that compliance requirement that we have to abide by. But just the beauty of it is it's an instant notification that, hey, you're kind of going beyond the bounds of what you're allowed to do with GitOps. 
All right. Um, we are going to open it up for any questions at this time. Are there any questions? Oh, no. There uh, are questions. Let me jump one over here. Um, with Cloud Foundry recently enabled with GitOps at, oh yeah, so the question was, um, we mentioned that one of the metrics that we capture is the, num like the files changed, and um, the question was, are there any other ones that we monitor as well? Or measure. Measure, sorry. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> and we can we can tag team on answering the ones that we remember. Um, we're heavy on measuring adoption first, right? With Cloud Foundry recently enabled. Another uh, bit is here's a product. We're hybrid cloud. We're multi cloud, mm -hmm. right? So we have the ability to capture here's product A, and where does it have footprint in our many strategic platforms? I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's like kind of worthwhile. Like even our even our cookbook. We measure mm -hmm. how many yeah. folks really get value out of the different sections. And it's funny how whenever we do a road show, you'd see an uptick on a certain section in our cookbook. Yeah. But again, it's all data-driven decisions. Even earlier when, the, when, when there's a question about deployment events and when you have massive changes, well, we have visibility into how often, what time of the day, and what time, what time in the week, what day in the week do these deployments happen? So we have an informed decision on when to do sweeping changes like this. Does that help? OK. What are some of the challenges that you faced in creating your multi-tenant cluster? And um, what did you do to be successful in that area? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess I should. Uh, OK, so that was actually like primarily, I think I took the lead on that last year. Um, yeah, there was, uh, it's, it's a little hard, I think, too, when there's an established platform team. Um, it, it, you you kind of have to get a working balance. Like, you have to make sure that you're not stepping on toes, but you want to get them on board as well. Um, we were lucky. They're, they're very willing to hear us out. Um, and You want to describe who's they? Oh, they as in the platform team, our on-prem Kubernetes platform team. They're already there, right? They were, they, they've been there for years. Our wow. operators. <laughs> so. Um, and basically, uh, it was, I mean, it was, it was really nice because there's a lot of documentation out there on how to do it. I don't think we found too much uh, hardship on that. It's nice also having a dedicated um, GitOps team because that's our jobs, right? We, we were able to um, mob on it and make it happen and like actually sit there. There were countless meetings. I mean, that's what we're going through even now. Um, every morning, we have a recurring meeting on setting up Flux 2. So basically, it was just a lot of trial and error. Um, we threw, we took that um, multi-tenancy repo that was already out there, the one that's um, uh, open source, mm -hmm. and we just kind of made it work for our internal environment. And so, enablement, no, not too hard. Buy-in, I mean, you know. <laughs> Does that it, it answer your question? Couple, yeah, it took a couple pitches to get yeah. it to, to take. But now, we're, we're happy to report that everyone loves it now, mm -hmm. even our operators. Like, like yeah. oh, we should get, get Opsify this. And yeah. everyone's just excited, right? It takes a while, but once they're there, it's... Did that answer your question? Yeah, we can talk later, yeah, for sure. Uh, we do have another question over here. Hi, guys. So you represent a large commercial organization, uh, bravely, and, you know, traveling down the GitHub throat. So I have a, um, a multi-part question. So since you operate in a large organization, do you guys have a semblance of a sort of unified, enterprise-wide GitOps strategy both on the methodology and tool chain and infrastructure side. That's uh, sort of the first part of the question. And second, um, do you guys incorporate any um, runtime uh, policy or what other way uh, image security scanning? Oh. And do you have any uh, policy around that? How to incorporate yeah. it in the GitOps process? I Thank you. I don't know if either of us caught the first part really yeah. well, but we can answer the second part and then. The first have... part is, do you have any enterprise-wide approach across the teams? How they go about provisioning clusters in the right way from the you know configurations and GitHub, uh, and how do you go about you know 
point in your pipelines, et cetera, et cetera? Do you have a uniform approach yeah. across the organization? That's actually a really good question. So we don't have a, a enterprise-wide cluster approach. I think it's more of like, so there's, there's these clusters that are maintained. Um, that's like the operators that we mentioned earlier. But it's more that like a team would request a namespace on our on-prem uh, uh, Kubernetes. And that process, they actually already had it. It's um, through a UI that they call the namespace portal. And we kind of just integrated with that. And uh, that's where, like, went through that process, there's a pipeline that actually um, stands up the multi-tenancy uh, uh, namespace repo that's being monitored by the, like, cluster level flux, right? And so in that one, that's where, like, that flux instance is stood up. And, and you can give it your, uh, your config repo URL. And so it'll, it'll be listening for that. Um, does that answer the first part of your question? Okay. If, if, I, if I may add, <laughs> okay, to, yeah. we're, we're not to the state that we want to be yet. We realize we have Kubernetes customers, not just on-prem. Yes, it's a large multi-tenant cluster, but we have Chris here for also from State Farm who <laughs> has this little EKS cluster. So our desired state is to continue to use Terraform in even how we stand up and standardize in how we stand up these clusters. Okay. <laughs> we'll get there. And then and the we'll second, keep sharing. The second part of the question about scanning images, I think you can hit on that too. Oh, wow. Oh, I, <laughs> yes, mean, yes. I think you can. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And uh, we can chat some more, but before we were using, now it's going to be sneak. Before we were using, um, I'm drawing blank. Aqua. I'm, I'm drawing yes. a blank. Oh, yeah. Aqua, and then Thank we you. recently switched to sneak. <laughs> yeah. So we're going we're gonna to invite our next speaker to start setting up, but we do have time for some additional questions while that's happening. So this next one's from William. We'll move our stuff though. Okay. Um, how do you see or consider disaster recovery in that setup? How do you see disaster recovery? In that yeah. setup, how do you see disaster recovery? Okay, so I think we got this question online too for May earlier. <laughs> um, and the so I have mixed feelings on this. I mean, I know that like we obviously have created a heavy reliance on our GitLab instance, and we have seen it be down before. Um, my opinion is that like if, if GitLab is down, you can't run the tests, you can't run the pipelines, right? So your code really shouldn't be going to prod either way. But um, and we're, I mean, there was something you had earlier too. I think to answer that, besides that point that I was making. Reconcilers, the concept yeah. of reconciler. Yeah. But that's really a break glass scenario yeah. and not, may, may or may not cater into DR stuff, right? Um, so it's all in Git. We can roll back a commit SHA. I also understand that we're talking lots of components. So good luck rolling back the, in the right order, right? Um, so that, that's where we're at. We're not to that state yet where we can accurately report, okay, it's this entire stack of components that make up a product. But I will counter that though, right? With, like I said earlier, small miniature changes going straight to production, less context switching. So if what, what I change breaks, I know exactly how to fix it before I compound that with other problems. I also understand that maybe those problems don't surface right away. And that's the maturity point that we're getting to not just performance metrics observability, but actual business metrics. And that's gonna get into the progressive delivery topic that we really wanna get going on. Awesome, thank you so much. Give a round of applause. Thank you.